let me welcome all the uh, first let me welcome the audience and uh, thank nice for organizing this uh, huge conference and there are so many sessions uh, so many uh, speakers and scholars speaking some very very eminent scholars of course uh, and uh, the session that we proposed was uh, was to look at china what china is doing in different regions and what are the strategies that it is pursuing in those regions and how have the regions really responded to china's uh, you know tactics or strategies in the region so uh, this this is these are some, some of the leading questions that we gave to our uh, panel and uh, we will be looking at about uh, six or seven regions uh, we will without uh, wasting time i will uh, go to the first speaker uh, dr josukuti abraham is an associate professor at the department of uh, political science at the university of uh, kerala um, he will be speaking on uh, china and south asia obviously this is something that is of great interest to us in india as well as in nepal uh, so over to you sir uh, the we have a time limit of 7 minutes so we i would request you to keep to the time limit i'll give you a warning at around 6 minutes if that's okay with you yeah uh, thank you uma i uh, first of all thank nees for this opportunity and since i have only 7 minutes let me not uh, waste time uh, let me straight away begin i uh, speak on uh, china and south asia and in this uh, presentation uh, my key argument is that china follow multiple strategies to achieve its objectives in uh, south asia and the key objective is to Uh, effect a favorable balance of power to serve its economic and uh, expanding uh, kind of military even balancing interest and its great power ambitions in the south asian theater uh, and uh, it follows both or rather adopts both uh, bal uh, realist balancing and means of economic globalization to uh, to achieve its objectives so if you look at the south asia uh, region it is home to nearly 2 million uh, people 2 billion people adjoins china geographically and has some of the world's most dynamic uh, economies as well as uh, two uh, to three nuclear weapon states including uh, china uh, the region has very serious internal cleavages most notably the multi regional conflict uh, multi generational conflict between india and pakistan as well as the ongoing conflict uh, the current one in afghanistan and these some of these conflicts are so enduring particularly the border conflicts and other differences with pakistan and also the kind of uh, uh, problems india and china have at the border are kind of uh, have acquired some kind of enduring uh, nature so <clears throat> in short it is a region uh, struggling with a violent conflict nuclear armed brinkmanship extensive human development uh, you know challenges and potentially uh, syria crippling exposure to uh, the ravages of climate change and this region is very quite significant to uh, china in terms of its uh, access to indian ocean and also its expansion uh, its ambition to become a, a great power in the indo pacific uh, region and in that sense it has great maritime significance and strategic importance and might become a an area of future contestation uh, uh, so given the geographic centrality of uh, uh, china as a, neighbor, as a neighbor to five of the eight countries that make up south asia uh, china has always been a regional uh, heavyweight so historically it is uh, in a sense uh, involved much with the pakistan and uh, kind of periodic uh, border clashes with india and in the initial stages particularly if you look at uh, after the cold war Uh, china has followed a uh, peaceful uh, rise strategy and then later rechristened it as a uh, peaceful development strategy and uh, which uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, since 2012 has seen much of uh, great acceleration in its economic might through intensified trade of manufacturing goods while deliberating keeping a low profile in the security uh, arena and as we all know with the belt and road initiative it has tried to broaden its economic and even uh, military presence uh, in the region by offering uh, infrastructure projects uh, with the geopolitical ulterior motives so uh, and recently china sees south asia 
uh, as an important uh, region, a new springtime, or in China, in South China, in uh, China South Asia relations. And also it has uh, kind of rediscovered the strategic uh, status of South Asia and most relevant as, the, as one of the most relevant region with regard to the rise of China. So China has come to recognize South Asia as an important uh, uh, springtime in its rise, in its global rise. So uh, from the uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, law profile, so now China is striving for its achievement and rights in the Xi Jinping area, uh, uh, in the Xi Jinping era of China's rise as a great power, its visible right, uh, visible rise as a great power. So, uh, so South Asia has gained great significance in China's strategic uh, calculus. And therefore, uh, it has crafted a geostrategic approach to South Asia that uh, uh, seeks to secure its national interest and also to establish itself as a, a predominant uh, a kind of resident power in uh, South Asia. Uh, China has, uh, China's major objective is to establish a balance of power favorable to it through military balancing, through economic engagement, and particularly through the new multi-regional connectivity initiative called the Belt and Road Initiative. So to secure a favorable balance of power uh, in the region, it has gone for what we call a kind of string of world strategy under which it promotes Pakistan as a regional balancer and effectively engages all other uh, regional states, particularly uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Myanmar, uh, with the objective of boxing in India and that it cannot step out of South Asia and challenge China's primacy in the region. So it has multiple objectives, as I have already said, and it has very good relationship with uh, most of the South Asian countries, uh, perhaps uh, except India. So I do not want to expand on what kind of project China has uh, in its uh, neighborhoods uh, in South Asian countries. Uh, it includes railroad connectivities, port, uh, ports as we find in uh, Gwadar in Pakistan, Hambantota and Sri Lanka. And then of course, border roads, uh, uh, projects, rail, uh, air link projects and so on. So all these projects uh, are uh, in a way taking advantage of the economic globalization with the South Asian countries so as to serve its dual purpose of economic presence as well as uh, kind of realist uh, balancing against uh, India. So, uh, uh, and with uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID and uh, 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 the pandemic and the developments in Afghanistan, China has accelerated its uh, uh, growing presence or rather its uh, uh, assertiveness in South Asia. So, uh, we might notice that, that there is a, group, a China led grouping to uh, provide vaccines to South Asian countries, which it does not include India and the recent developments in Afghanistan gives further uh, leverage to China's uh, plans in uh, South Asia. And of this, uh, we all know how Pakistan is a, a all front, all weather ally of China serving its interest through the CPEC. And there is, uh, as we all know, very good understanding with the Pakistan and China that uh, makes it makes its presence very powerful. In China. And that is also the case with most of the South Asian countries. Now, uh, having uh, said that, I do not want to explain what are China's projects in these countries because everybody knows about it. So uh, uh, I would go for uh, the final uh, few sentences, which says that China's policy is to optimize its multi-regional connectivity uh, uh, through various economic programs, connective infrastructure developments to serve the dual purpose of economic benefits and favorable balance. It adopts different strategies with the different countries to realize objectives. With India, it adopts some kind of hard balancing with economic connectivity to contain China's influence in the region. With other uh, powers in the region, other countries in the region, economic platform is used as the key means, but takes special care that it serves the dual purpose of achieving geopolitical objectives as well. And uh, uh, these objectives and plans are been going on uh, for some time very well, and it has uh, served China's interest uh, very well. And the reactions of uh, South Asia, India's reaction, as we all know that uh, 
uh, it has uh, uh, because of the recent development in the border as well as the fundamental difference between these two countries. China, India is the only country that is uh, kind of have disagreements with China's plans in South Asia. Other countries are kind of balancing between India and China, probably except Pakistan, which is very much, very much moving along with China. So the smaller countries in South Asia are taking advantage of the kind of peer competition between India and China and South Asia. But a few countries like Pakistan, and now in the case of Afghanistan also, is siding with China. So this is the scenario where it gives a leverage to China and South Asia. So, uh, so China's South Asia policy has been those started in a benign mode as uh, has been gaining great assertiveness and uh, in terms of uh, uh, realizing its uh, uh, both liberal and realist objectives of real ob uh, liberal objective in terms of taking advantage of economic globalization and the realist objective of containing China and South Asia. So China's South Asia policy has dual objectives, as I said, uh, one is of so you have contributing it. Yes. Minute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the first objective was contributing its economic prosperity. And the second the objective of geopolitical objective of uh, entering in the Indian Ocean and then uh, connecting to connecting the developments in South Asia to the Indo-Pacific developments where uh, China could challenge or rather uh, kind of uh, compete in the, in the Indo-US alliance in, in, in Indo-Pacific and this gaining a, a strong ground in the Indian Ocean. With this, I stop. Thank you. Thank you, sir. In a very short time, you have brought out both the theoretical aspects and the practical aspects of China's engagement with South Asia. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions for you later. But for now, uh, let me move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Vignesh Ram. He is the Division Head for Political Risks and Intelligence Services Management, Covins Network at, at Bangalore. He'll be speaking on China and Southeast Asia. Uh, Vignesh, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uma, and I hope I'm audible. And uh, as the introduction has already been done on the topic, so I won't dwell on much on that. Um, first of all, before I move on to the presentation, uh, I'd like to thank the panel members for setting up this interesting panel and Nice Nepal for organizing this sort of a festival of knowledge of sorts. Uh, the limited time provided to me, I will be providing a brief overview of China and Southeast Asia and mapping them with the following vectors. Uh, I will be looking at them in the political arena, economic arena, mostly focusing on how ties have moved from interdependence to dependence. Um, security relations, which have remained a key anomaly while considering and comparing the ties to trading uh, relations vis-a-vis -vis China, and mainly moving on to look at extra-regional power relations and how they have been impacting the relations between countries in Southeast Asia and China. Um, uh, while analyzing China in the current context, my presentation today would start with looking at roughly from the decade which uh, started the debates on China's rise, uh, which later retransfixed into peaceful rise or development. Uh, the transformational decade now saw developments in above mentioned fields, uh, which we used as the vectors for this uh, particular presentation. Now, politically, the decades of maturity in relations in both the maritime and the mainland Southeast Asian countries with China, um, while the decades saw the cultivation of bilateral ties of a lot of developments at the regional level, they also showed that what, what leverage China had developed in terms of the ties. Now, we can see the examples of politics on post-Asian uh, economic crisis of 97 and later the formulation of the ASEAN plus three and further the East Asia summit as valid examples of how China played an important role as a regional power in Southeast Asia. However, China was still seen as one of the balancing forces, if not the preponderant power, if we can put it in that context within the web of ASEAN political engagements in Southeast Asia. A good example of this is the formation of the ASEAN centric forum, such as the ASEAN regional forum in the 1990s. Um, in the economic realm, we did see uh, the progressive move towards bridging the gaps in inter-regional trade in Southeast Asia with the implementation of the AFTA, the ASEAN free trade area, and the inclusion of the CLMV countries, the Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, the mainland Southeast Asian countries within ASEAN, and subsequently within the trade realm within the Southeast Asian uh, region. However, if you see the trade figures within the region, China's trade remains unmatched even today. Um, in fact, uh, the latest data shows that the trade has been closed around 731.9 billion, 
Um, uh, China has uh, remained ASEAN's largest trading partner since 2008, while the ASEAN bloc as a whole has become China's largest trading partner bloc. Uh, so economically, of course, uh, uh, when we speak about bilateral relations, we have to look at also the larger geoeconomic uh, position. And geoeconomically, Southeast Asian countries have proved to be an important cog in the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, if you see, for example, the Maritime Silk Road was announced in Indonesia, uh, Southeast Asia's largest economy. And of course, also strategically important, Singapore was one of the first to join the uh, Belt and Road Initiative in the initial offering. Um, however, security interests cannot be far behind when we consider the challenges which are there now, uh, which have been posed to regional states. Uh, for instance, the safety and security of the sea lines of communication uh, has been one very important uh, facet of maritime security relations in the region. Now, of course, uh, if you look at, uh, if we club this along with the multiple maritime security challenges with regional countries, and also the hostile use of force in the South, China, South and the East China Sea unilaterally, have put the countries in the region, at least the claimants, to remain in an awkward accommodation with China due to their imbalanced ties uh, in the trade and challenges uh, in the security realm. Now, politically, the joint approach by China has uh, split ASEAN, which was negotiating together, at least initially, with regards to the South China Sea dispute, taking advantage of the CLMV countries and their dependencies on China. Now, of course, if you look at also from the prism of naval capacity, uh, there has been uh, dramatically and over it, it has grown dramatically and it also overshadows, uh, if you see, in terms of most of the other countries in Southeast Asia put together. And uh, so this has been often a bone of contention between uh, these two entities in, this, uh, in the security realm. So this finally brings me to the last point on how China-Southeast Asia relations have been shaped externally by extra-regional countries and uh, extra-regional countries and their relations with uh, both powers. The first point would be the shifting of power relations and a vacuum, at least until a renewed focus on the region in holistic uh, was sent was put on the region with the uh, rebalancing strategy which was uh, put across by the united states uh, we see that this uh, gradual pull out or the regional power vacuum was uh, was an occurring phenomenon since the end of the cold war uh, now whether this facilitated china's rise and in part its belligerence is a question which we can ponder upon the second pointer here is the impact of China's relations with US impacts the Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia region as a whole, though it benefits the security trade nexus, uh, that, that security and trade nexus actually challenges the region in terms of picking one side, which the countries have always tried to avoid. Doctor, uh, you have one more minute. Yes, I'm towards my conclusion. Thank you. Uh, now, a fitting conclusion to this would be to look at what the current situation is on the regional security environment. Now, in the three frames of discussion, we can see that domestically, though countries have been aligned in different power centers in the region, the challenge towards a singular vision of what the Indo-Pacific meant was not achieved without an internal bickering among the countries. Uh, the elephant in the room, of course, unsaid, of course, was the tone of the agreement to the sound was more like an anti china was whether the Indo-Pacific sounded more as an anti-China coalition and was rather siding with the Quad. So countries here also wanted to balance themselves. And regionally, ASEAN's influence has been under question with its core principle of centrality, has been questioned with the emergence of the Quad and the rising influence of China and the trading system within the regional folds. The RCEP is a good example. Now, the shifting of ASEAN centrality sets a challenging precedent for more unstable regional calculus moving towards a close competition for influence among other powers, not having a central role for the organization. Now, this opens up the regional space for competing interests and a challenge for regional security. The international setting um, is no different when we look at the international level in terms of the increasing complexity. So it is safe to say that the regional geopolitics has changed considerably, even for, for US starting, it's uh, fr from even from the part when we see that starting this presentation here, when we looked at the peaceful uh, rise or development of China as a doctrine, we see that regional geopolitics has considerably changed. And uh, finally, these are some of the concluding observations. Um, if I can just leave them on the slide while the, uh, 
while the uh, chair actually introduces the next speaker, I, I, we can have this to be discussed during the uh, present, uh, during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Vignesh. Uh, I think that was, uh, you know, the analysis was uh, like a very good political risk analyst. So <laughs> that's exactly. a little different from our usual academic presentations, but quite uh, comprehensible and succinct. Uh, my, the next speaker is Dr. Uh, Georgin John, a friend from JNU. He is now also a research fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs. Uh, Dr. Georgin will be speaking on uh, China and East Asia. Over to you, Georgin. You're muted. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Uma, for uh, putting up this panel, and also thank you, a uh, nice Nepal, for giving me this opportunity. Well, uh, the, in my presentation, I will be looking at the rise of China and East Asia, particularly looking at uh, what does China's um, rise mean for East Asia, in particular, the uh, security order in East Asia. Um, the spe uh, previous speakers have uh, dealt some aspects of the rise of China. And so perhaps um, it's advisable to, uh, to leave out the, uh, the factual aspects, the general aspects of final, uh, the rise of China. Uh, so what I'll try to do is to give a brief um, I mean, introduction in terms of uh, China's rise from the East Asian perspective, then try to look at what does it actually mean for the East Asian security order. Um, the rise of China, of course, is the most important phenomenon in the contemporary international relations. For sure, the rise of China is a multifaceted phenomenon with a wide range of implications. Uh, of all the regions in the world, um, and it's in fact, uh, and the rise, uh, rise of China's impact is more felt in the East Asian region, considering obvious um, ge uh, geographical, historical, and cultural, and strategic reasons. For China, um, it's perhaps the most important region if the Chinese leaders um, wishes to pick up the pieces of the changing world order, uh, which they seems to be doing so, um, one of the first tasks would be to take substantial leadership role as an East Asian, East Asia's region, um, East Asia's indigenous uh, great power. Um, so uh, to give a perspective on, on the China's rise from an East Asian perspective, um, it's important to look at uh, how China has evolved in, in related terms in the region. Um, uh, in, that, in that sense, while the rise of China perhaps is a multifaceted phenomenon, the multidimensionality of it is, is fundamental rests on the primary, primarily on the economic rise of China. Since the end of the Cold War, Chinese economy measured in nominal uh, terms has grown from somewhat uh, 400 billion US dollars in 19, 90s to a 10 trillion dollar economy in 2005, 2015. Today it's a 16 trillion economy, making it the second largest economy after the US. So it is predicted that the China's will become the second largest economy in nominal GDP terms in 2028. So in, if one were to look at this Chinese economy in terms of um, per capita, I mean PPP terms, so today is the it's the largest economy in the world already. Uh, in comparison to East Asia, um, China in East Asia, China accounts for about today accounts for about seventy one percent of the East Asian economy. Um, China took uh, overtook Japan as the world's second largest economy in two thousand ten. So to understand. The, the rise of China from a regional perspective, it's a, a comparative understanding of a Chinese Japanese economy or the Chinese economy with respect to the other um, regional economy in a historical sense would uh, make, makes clear how the dynamics played out. I mean, when China and uh, Japan um, uh, normalized the diplomatic relations in the late 1970s, and Japanese economy was 10 times bigger than the Chinese economy. Um, in 2020, the Japanese economy was 
four times bigger than the Chinese economy. It's in 2010, the Chinese economy overtook J Japanese economy as the, the second largest eco economy in the world. And today in 2020, I mean, in 2020, the Chinese economy is three times bigger than the Japanese economy. If you were to look at uh, Korea in comparison, uh, 2000, in 1990, the two economies were of comparable size. In 2010, China was uh, five times bigger than, the China, uh, bigger than the Korean economy. And today, it is 10 times the, uh, than, bigger than the Korean economy. And uh, this has been the phenomenon across the, uh, on, on, on different scales. Uh, and and uh, Chinese emergence as a powerhouse of regional growth can also be shown in, f in, uh, in the fact that China is now the biggest trading partner virtually of every countries in the region. Um, uh, and and uh, for, uh, for instance, if one were to look at the Korean economy, uh, Korea's trade relations, uh, China, uh, Korea's trade with China is, is um, more than its trade with Japan and the United States. Um, it's also reflected in intensified regional production networks, people-to-people uh, -people interactions, uh, tourism, foreign students, on every indicator, uh, China has become the, uh, the dominant player in almost all the East Asian countries. Uh, uh, Chinese uh, economic uh, rise in the region has also reflected in Chinese efforts to reshape the regional economic order through Chinese-led economic initiatives, including BRI, AIB, and other free trade regional um, uh, agreements, including RCEP. Um, despite the Chinese rise as an economic, uh, the dominant economic actor, it does not mean to say that it, uh, it, it has replaced the uh, United States as the dominant uh, uh, economic actor in the region. Um, I mean, this as, uh, Chinese rise has also been reflected in the regional military balance um, which has been shifting largely because of the ri uh, rise of China's military might. According to CIPRI, uh, CIPRI um, data, China defense spending increased by 85% in the last 10 years, uh, while the US defense expenditure um, together with uh, um, declined in 15%, and Japan's increased only by 2% uh, uh, over the same period. In absolute terms, the United States still remains the uh, the dominant economic, um, sorry, um, defense actor uh, spender uh, with an aggregate figure of um, uh, 700 billion US dollars, while China remains the second, in the second place uh, with, uh, which spends around uh, 250 billion dollars in 2020. Uh, compared to that, Japan spends about uh, four, uh, 47 uh, billion US dollars. For about 70 years, uh, the US military has dominated the seas and the skies of East Asia, enjoying almost total freedom of movements and the ability to deny uh, such so freedom of- Dr. John, you have like one minute more. Oh, okay. So uh, what does the rise of China means for East Asian order? The international order in East Asia that emerged as an outcome of the Pacific war and on the wake of the Cold War was underpinned by the primacy of American power and the American bilateral lines in Asia, also known as the hub and spoke system. It was further reinforced uh, with, the Chi uh, with the US China rapprochement in 1970s. Since what uh, uh, the, the region has seen um, a 40 year period of, of one would call the, the East Long Peace, has been uncontested. Uh, U.S. primacy in, in across the board. Um, the U.S. law secure order also ensured uh, the stability and uh, the economic and provided the condition for economic development in the region. Um, in the post Cold War order, though uh, there has been significant change in the regional economic order, featuring uh, regional economic integration, proliferation of FTAs, expansion of regional production networks, the U.S. led uh, security order in East Asia endured. Um, um, the Chinese economic rise in its quest for influence and status in East Asia uh, from a structural perspective means a challenge to an uncontested US primacy in the region and the return of great power competition in the region. While the narrative of great power uh, rivalry in the context of US-China has been around since new millennia, it receives 
uh, much attention in the post 2008 financial uh, period. The uh, discourse of Chinese assertiveness and the US um, United States determined pivot rebalance to Asia in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis, security analysts in the region and beyond have um, wondering whether or not East Asia has been drifting towards a polarization. The strategic analysts uh, have been noted the emergence of two Asia or a dual structure in which an economic Asia increasingly depends on the uh, on China for trade, investment, and markets, and Security Asia looking for United States for uh, security guarantee. The problem is that the dynamics of the two Asia or the dual structure has been increasingly irreconcilable, particularly during the late years of Trump presidency, and the pandemic has uh, further exacerbated the situation. The recent talk of decoupling in the US given rise to the narrative of a new Cold War, despite the fact that the US and China, uh, great power rivalry in structural terms uh, is its characteristics as indicated by the bipartisan consensus on uh, China in the United States. The situation is far from suggesting that the region is moving towards a bipolar order in the uh, like the Cold, Cold War Lake. Unlike the Cold War uh, period, uh, where the US and Soviet Union had a very little economic interaction, China and the United States, um, highly independent, and the two Asias are not mutually exclusive. Uh, if I could take a minute, uh, is that okay? Yes, yes, any case. Well, um, well I mean, uh, uh, I will cut, more, cut short my presentation by, uh, by highlighting uh, key features that I think are the important aspects of the emerging order in East Asia, uh, the, the intensified US-China strategic rivalry, which it seems to uh, emerge as a, a structural characteristics, uh, indicating the return of a great power relationship in uh, East Asia, which also says that uh, the uncontested primacy of the United States, which has been the um, the feature of the earlier East Asian order is, is come, came to an end. Um, it also, in the second aspect of the, it's all uh, indicating of the regional security alliances and partnerships indicated by the, uh, the intensification of US um, traditional security alliances and partnership across the board. Uh, the third feature has been the increased strategic dilemma of the regional powers. Uh, the countries, uh, the regional countries, which has been actively um, adopted uh, uh, strategic hedging all the period, uh, they have all, all been um, pushed into a, a, a deep strategic dilemma. The fourth aspect is the, uh, well, uh, the emergence of new security actors, particularly countries like Japan, Australia, and uh, India, and all are becoming an, uh, important security actors in the East Asian region. Um, well, the fifth aspect uh, of the East Asian security architecture, it seems to me that the, there is an expansion of the scope of the regional security order. Uh, so what it, it, it implies is the, I mean, particularly with the discourse of Indo-Pacific, what uh, traditionally uh, we understood the East Asian security order as, as, as a, as a um, is no longer relevant in terms of understanding the regional security architecture. So what we, uh, implied to uh, what 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 is uh, come, uh, appears to be is like the emergence of a sort of a network a security act. In that sense, it is a process that is uh, a, a, an expansion of regional the scope of the regional security ar architecture. So, in conclusion, uh, among other things, uh, uh, the rise of China has contributed to the uh, tight, uh, uh, reconfiguration of the regional. Uh, security uh, regional um, imbalance of power. It, 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 it challenged the US primacy uh, in the region and the US led uh, security order in East Asia. Um, the managing rise of China has been the most important and not only the foreign, but also domestic uh, political changes, uh, challenges for many of the East Asian countries. It is um, clearly the case that the regional order is transforming and it is now uh, we are in, we're seeing the order shifting and we are in, in a state of an in-between orders where the old one is enduring and the new one is yet to emerge, creating a 
a lot of uncertainty. What we are witnessing today is a search for new order, uh, so leading to whole range of a whole new range of alignment experiments like quad and the conceptual innovation like innovation as part of the process of finding a new a regional equilibrium. Thank you. I'll stop. It. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jorjin. Uh, I think you've brought out very clearly the dynamics of uh, the uh, power relations that are playing out in East Asia. Uh, let me now introduce our uh, next guest, uh, next speaker. Uh, our speak next speaker is Dr. Nanda Kishore. He is head and associate professor at the Manipal uh, Academy of uh, Higher Education. He's at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations. He will be speaking on China and West Asia. Over to you, Dr. Nanda Kishore. Uh, thank you, Uma. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Pramod, uh, for this opportunity. And thanks to all my uh, co-panelists for an excellent presentation so far. I'm sure the remaining will also be the same. Um, Without wasting much time, let me just directly go ahead with, I'm not delving too much into uh, the initial part of the um, story, but I'm directly getting into what, um, what I want to do for the next maybe six and a half minutes or whatever that is available to me. Um, is the screen moving or it's not? Yeah. It is, it is right? Yeah. Okay, for, for somehow, for a long time, it's been the case that uh, we've been uh, looking at, especially last one decade, it's very interesting that the United States has been trying to disengage from West Asia, whereas the regional powers, including Iran, Israel, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey have responded by seeking new allies and also competing more fiercely uh, with one another. Now, China has significantly increased its economic, political, uh, and to a lesser extent, security footprint in West Asia in the past decade, becoming the biggest trade partner and external investor for many countries. That is there, uh, no doubt about it. But at the same time, Beijing was already the largest buyer of the region's oil. Now, without fanfare, it has also become the only outside power that has strong political and trading ties with every major country there. Now, with the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, the Chinese government decided to expand its influence in West Asia and the world in general, and to provide an alternative source of financial assistance to some cash-strapped governments, more so very specific to this region with regard to Iran, where Iran was struggling to even pay the uh, school teachers. That was the sort of scenario that was existing. If we go further uh, from there to look at China uh, still has a limited appetite for challenging the US-led security architecture. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it wants to play a significant role, but it's on a little confused way how to go about it. Uh, now, as a strategically important crossroads for trade routes and sea lanes linking Asia to Europe and Africa, West Asia is an important uh, component for the future of BRA itself. Uh, there where it wants to expand its global trade networks, now, for the moment, China's relationship with the region focuses on the Gulf states due to their predominant role in energy markets. China, uh, China also has a vision for multipolar order, and their idea has been from the perspective of developmental peace rather than the Western notion of democratic peace, because they think development itself will start bringing peace rather than going on organically trying to impose democratic peace and then trouble someone. Now, this is how the Belt and Road Initiative looks in. It wants to cover a large uh, area where it brings in all those people under the uh, AIIB, there where it sees the strength and it wants to have larger control. And anyway, the sea lanes of communications are of great help to it. Now, as I mentioned before itself, uh, it participates in a lot of things. In fact, uh, in anti-piracy maritime security missions in the Arabian Sea, as well as the Gulf of Aden, it has also conducted large-scale operations to rescue its nationals from Libya and Yemen. There where some people are seeing that there is an opportunity that's associated with, with China taking a greater role, but it has been extremely hesitant. Uh, it was also instrumental in persuading Tehran to uh, sign uh, the Iran nuclear deal and appointed two special envoys uh, for the West Asian um, countries in terms of conflict itself, there, because there have been scholars who have been writing on uh, China's role in terms of the conflict negotiation and management in the region. Now, Beijing has been extremely careful not to become too involved, which because it still believes that US can take responsibility for managing security. 
It has also worked with Russia on the UN Security Council to protect Syrian regime, not exactly because they, they love Syrian regime or anything, but their interest has been very clear in terms of the non-interference. Second is to make sure that all their communication strategies are in tune with their business strategy. Now, given the recent series of incidents in the Straits of Hormuz that increased tensions between Iran and the geopolitical opponents, China could be forced to take uh, on a greater security role to protect the freedom of navigation crucial to its energy security itself. At least for that sake, it, will, it would want to get engaged more and more. Now, already China has developed comprehensive strategic partnership with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, as well as UAE. When we say as Arab world, if we have to uh, put it in that perspective, though Egypt does not directly come into West Asia, it's very difficult to um, delineate them and then speak about it. Now, while its influence in Iran has increased significantly following the signing of a 25-year cooperation plan with Iran, now Chinese tech companies are involved in the most important technological projects in the uh, region, such as Smart Dubai 2012 and the Saudi Arabia's uh, National Transformation Program 2030, which has been also a dream project for Mohammed bin Salman. Now, the Belt and Road Ini Initiative somewhere envisages the creation of a vast network of railways, highways, energy pipelines, and the building of 50 special economic zones. Now, more than 60 countries have signed the BRI project, which is largely uh, what China uh, speaks of a strength. China has already spent more than US dollar uh, 200 billion on such particular projects, but according to some estimates, this amount could rise to uh, US dollar 1.2 trillion by 2027 is what they're talking about. Now coming directly to, because it's, it's not been very, very clear when it comes to the question of, uh, it's getting involved too many uh, in too many issues. It's been on the Islamist side, it's been getting involved with whatever that is happening in many of these states. It's been trying to go cozy to them. It's been off late trying to go close to Turkey because Turkey tried raising the Xinjiang issue uh, about the Uyghur Muslims and other things, but it wants to put them down. And it, at the same time, it wants to create a lot and lot of infrastructure that is much more crucial for, uh, for China to sustain, especially with the COVID-19 hurting its ambitions and going forward, it wants to expand itself in this particular region. The vacuum for sure has been created by the United States. Has, had Trump been there, I think the scenario would have been different. Even if the United States would have disengaged from the region, they would have not given up that easily for China. But unfortunately, that's not been the case as of now. So they're finding it as the best time to come in. So in the face of inconsistent policies from the US and with an eye to a future with uh, greater Chinese power and influence, leaders in the West Asia have been receptive to Chinese outreach. That's also there is reciprocity, which uh, none of us can uh, feel agitated about. The BRI addresses their domestic development concerns and at the same time signals Beijing's intentions to become more invested in the region. Now, this comes at a moment when Western countries, particularly the US, suffers from West Asia fatigue itself. It has been struggling to which we have been witnessing uh, in, in, in Afghanistan as well. Now at this stage, it's hard to determine whether this is merely a hedging strategy designed to diversify their extra regional power partnerships, or if it signals the beginning of a realignment that stretches across West Asia to East Asia itself. But it's clear, however, that China will be engaged, uh, will be an engaged partner with a clearly articulated, articulated approach to building a stronger presence in the region. I think I'm done with my seven minutes. Thank you, Uma. Thank you uh, for the panel and all the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nandakisho, for, sp uh, for spending exactly seven minutes, I think. You, you finished right on time. Um, I will now move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Stuti Banerjee. Uh, she and I have been classmates and friends. We were classmates for nine years, uh, right from MA to PhD. But of course, she's not here because she's my friend. She is a very well established scholar. Uh, she is a research fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs. And from West Asia, we, will, we are now going to move all the way to Latin America. So, uh, Dr. Banerjee will be speaking on uh, China's engagement with Latin America. Over to you, Stuti. Thank you so much, Uma. I hope I'm audible. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Uma, for giving this, me this opportunity. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Nice Nepal for a very well conceived and organized seminar. Uh, so my topic that uh, I've taken is China's engagement in Latin America. And since very few people really look at Latin America, I will start with something which uh, I think is very important to know, which is that Latin America and the Caribbean region is not one monolithic whole. There are 33 nations in it. 
So essentially, you're looking at China's engagement in a very, very vast area. Uh, the engagements that China has had in this region date back to uh, just after independence of a lot of countries here. But bringing it to the present, I will start with somewhere about uh, 2001, where we see that China starts engaging very much with Latin America, and the start is very slow. Uh, in 2001, we see President Jiang Zemin starting a visit to seven countries in the region and essentially opening the door to China's engagement with Latin America. His uh, visit is followed by a series of trips by his successors in 2004, 2008. And thereafter, you have visits by officials from the Chinese government, both high ranking as well as lower level officials, uh, businessmen, industry houses, etc., expanding on the relationship. And these uh, visits have not just been confined to larger states like Brazil, Argentina, Chile, but have also included smaller countries like Costa Rica, Cuba, etc. So it kind of opened the door for China to come and interact in this area. It was helped by the fact that a lot of countries of the region were ideologically inclined towards China at this time. What also had an advantage for Chinese engagement in Latin America was the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, a lot of these countries used uh, China's investment and the money that China gave to their economies to kind of get over the global recession. Uh, so if you look at China's engagement in Latin America, I will divide it into three segments, which is the political engagement, the economic engagement, and the security aspects uh, through which they're collaborating here. Now, if you look at the political engagement, you find that uh, China and uh, the Latin American countries are engaged in a lot of multilateral uh, dialogue processes. There are bilateral dialogues, which China is holding here. Of course, the most important being the BRICS. Uh, that was one of the most uh, popular or the biggest organizational, multilateral organizational uh, dialogue that they have. But Essentially, what you find is that the political engagements are for China a step in their economic direction. Uh, economics has been the foundation of the relationship China has with Latin America. And you find that from uh, a bilateral trade in 2001 of about 10 billion, it has grown about 26 fold uh, to about $316 billion in 2019. Now, the current pandemic situation has seen a dip in the trade relations, but it has only dipped by about a little bit. So the two, two, 2020 figures that I have is of $315 billion of trade. Now, China is now currently one of the top trading partners of a number of nations in Latin America, a position which was traditionally taken over by the United States. Um, but what you find is that while the US continues to be the country for Latin American nations to have interactions on economic issues with, but there are projections that by 2035, China is going to dominate Latin America in terms of the economic. So what you will have in Latin America is a situation where they would be politically inclined towards the United States, but economically they would be very much inclined towards China. Now, apart from bilateral trade, what you have is that Chinese loans and foreign direct investments in the region have also seen a growth. And this is allowing the region to overcome a lot of its developmental challenges. Uh, Latin America has a lot of inequality and it feels that Chinese investments and uh, Chinese companies coming and setting up industries there is going to help it overcome this bridge between the haves and haves not. China is also um, looking at the region as a huge potential for because of its market growth. And it feels that this can be exploited in the future for towards a political advantage. The other factor is that Latin America as a grouping, like I said, there are 33 countries. They make an enormous chunk in any global arena. And therefore, they play a very important role in terms of influence that can be exerted in the global political platforms. China has uh, you know, formed a dialogue process, which is the China CELAC Forum. Uh, CELAC is a community of Latin American Caribbean nations and China holds annual events with them. It, China has become a member of the a number of you know, uh, economic organizations which are uh, in the region, such as 
Mercosur, uh, the ALBA group, the Asia Pacific Economic Council, etc. And these organizations, which there are a number of in Latin America, essentially cover all the countries. So one organization will have uh, Central American countries, another will look at South American countries, another has uh, Caribbean countries and China is interacting as dialogue partners as observers in nearly all of them. Apart from these um, government pack or known groups, China is also ensuring that there is interaction at the people to people level and at the business to business level. And the people to people level, I would like to point out that it is looking at academics very um, in this region, it has established dialogues between students, it has established dialogues between, you know, these youth uh, meetings and, you know, youth forums between China and Latin American universities. It is also looking at uh, platforms such as think tanks and university collaboration. So China is trying to address all of these um, different sections of Latin American public and political uh, at the same time. China has also uh, looking at engagements in the region, which have, um, you know, which will be, which will strengthen the relationship in the future. So it's one of the few countries which started off in having a China, uh, you know, looking at Latin America in terms of a strategic partnership and coming out with policy papers on it. And in 2008, it published its first policy paper. And if you read it, uh, these policy papers of which it has published three of them, you will find it is a very systematic look at what are these trends in Latin America currently, where are the areas that China and Latin America are collaborating, and essentially, which is the future areas or sectors in which Latin America would want to uh, you know, move forward in, and what are the expertise China can provide in these sectors. So it is looking at not just investment, but it is looking at a sector by sector uh, growth in Latin American economy and how China can partner with them. And it is identifying them and moving in ahead before anybody else can. So it shows a desire from China to work in all areas from industry to technology, from military to civil, from education to environment, economics to culture, anything in every sector that Latin America has. Uh, and all of this, I find, is essentially a base for the deeping, deepening of its economic engagements in Latin America. Now, BRI is uh, China's flagship program of economic integration across the world. And you would find it very strange that because BRI is essentially looked at in terms of road and rail infrastructure and how is Latin America, which is you know, divided uh, away from, sorry, uh, China through oceans. How is that going to be part of BRI? So within the BRI, China has identified its maritime aspect, as well as something it calls the digital highway. So it is in these two areas that it is looking at um, Latin America. So in terms of BRI, there are 19 countries in Latin America which either support the BRI or are interested in projects in it. As part from infrastructure projects, which of course Chinese have an expertise on, they are building roads and railways, ports and energy plants in Latin America. China is also looking at uh, digital infrastructure in these areas. So it is uh, going in for information technology sector, enhancing the finance, what we call um, you know, digital financing, what we are currently using in India, the entire digitization process in India, that is something Latin American nations are also doing, especially in the banking sector. So these are areas where China is trying to get into Latin America. And it is also looking at telecommunication, the entire 5G network that is being talked about while, uh, you know, the United States and a number of nations in Europe have a concern about Chinese companies. Latin America right now is very focused on 5G connections and it finds that Chinese companies provide it with this technology at very competitive prices, despite the security uh, risks that, that have been flagged by the United States. So these are areas in which China is trying to get into in the future uh, in terms of how it would like the economic relations with Latin America to grow for it. It is stemming from this that it is also looking at a security partnership. Now, uh, security of Latin America has largely been the uh, taken care of by the United States, but one finds that in over the last 
uh, few years in the past decade or so, the US interest in securing Latin America in terms of its bases there has reduced. It has a military presence. It will continue to have this military presence, but this military presence has reduced. It is now used for very specific uh, intelligence uh, gathering. It is used for very specific uh, projects in terms of drug and narco trafficking uh, operations. So there is a reduction in the presence and the scope that the US military and US security forces are doing with their counterparts in Latin America. And China hopes to fill in this gap. It is right now trying to do uh, in terms of hardware sell it is selling very nominal amounts of hardware to Latin American militaries, uh, it sells uh, body armor, small arms and things like that. But it hopes that in future, as China's own military industry expands, it would be able to capture the market in Latin America. The one area that China really wants to focus in, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll just wrap up. Uh, so the other area that China is looking at is essentially space technology. And one finds that this is becoming a uh, a concern for the uh, uh, United States because uh, China has a space uh, based, uh, uh, you know, uh, it has a satellite and space station in Argentina right now, which for China, the justification is, is looking at the moon and studying the various aspects of the moon, but United States feel it is going to be used for surveillance. So these are the various areas that China is looking at in Latin America. And as um, the United States influence reduces, one finds that China is, is likely to increase more and more. Thanks so much, Ma. Thank you, uh, uh, Stuti. Well, it's quite a multifaceted engagement that China seems to be having with Latin America. And I think uh, Indian policymakers should certainly be paying more attention to what is happening there. Uh, anyway, uh, as the chair, I think I'll speak last and I would now call upon uh, Brijesh Srivastava. Uh, he's a research scholar at the Central University of Haryana uh, to speak on China's uh, revisionist approach to the Indo Pacific. Uh, thank you, Nish. And am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, please go. Yeah. Thank you, Nish. And thank you, ma'am. Uh, my topic is uh, China's revisionist approach to Indo Pacific. So, first of all, I will uh, discuss about revisionist approach and strategic importance of Indo Pacific. Political scientists have traditionally divided countries into status quo and revisionist powers. In the origins of revisionist and status quo states, Davidson defines revisionist as those who seek to change the things as they are in international politics. Status quo strive to preserve as things are in international politics. Indo-Pacific is adjudged to be the center of the globe in terms of politics and economics. Strategically, the Indo-Pacific has been seen as a continuum across Indian and Pacific oceans joined together by its main trading channel, the Straits of Malacca. Two broad regions explain the rise of strategic imagination of the Indo-Pacific. First, the growing footprint of China across the length and breadth of the region, and second, the relative decline of the U.S. alliance system and its strive for a resurgence. Now I will discuss the, discuss the glimpse of the dangerous game China has been playing in Indo-Pacific. The French emperor Napoleon Bonaparte is believed to have said, quote, let China slip, for when she wakes, she will save the world. The consequences of China's awakening are being felt around the world. And the region most affected by that awakening is the Indo-Pacific. China has tried to convince the world that it is pursuing a peaceful rise." Unquote. Addressing in the 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly, General Secretary G stated, we will never seek hegemony, expansion, our sphere of influence. We have no intention to fight either a cold war or a hot war with any country. The war seems already to have begun. The above only gives a glimpse of the dangerous game China has been playing, especially since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
China action are the only providing detrimental to its interests. However, as the world unites to fight it as a common aggressor, the encirclement of China has begun and now the task at hand is to stop China from writing the rules that bind the international system. Uh, now I will discuss Chinese expanded views of the region. With the rise of Chinese power, Beijing has slowly explored its nascent redefinition of the region. China's expanded vision is driven internally by economic development and externally by geopolitics. When the USA does develop its strategy along with the notion of the Indo-Pacific, Beijing will have to respond, thus presently forcing Chinese policymakers and scholars to broaden their perception of the region. Through a combination of continental power and maritime connection to the Indian Ocean, China seems to have a stronger strategic linkage between Central Asia and the Indian Ocean than the USA, whose influence in Central Asia is limited due to the geographical discontinuity between its Pacific power and Central Asia. However, it has also been noted that there might be negative elements associated with China's expanded view of the region. When China was dragged into an extended version of the grand strategy of the Indo-Pacific region, it faced new question of strategic overstretching. Now I will examine China's two competi competing strategic response to the idea of the Indo-Pacific region. One strategy equates the Indo-Pacific with the Quad and is completely opposed to it. The other copes the idea of the Indo-Pacific and explores regional cooperation under the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative. Both views are associated with government think tanks. Chinese scholars consider the Indo-Pacific a manufactured super region designed to hedge against a pursued Sino-centric regional order. For those worried about the containment of China by the USA and its allies and partners, the Indo-Pacific concept seemed, to, seemed only to confirm their suspicious. Washington's China policy in that it regards China as a strategic competitor has taken a qualitative change from constructive engagement to a new style of Cold War. As part of their strategy, the USA aims to establish a grand alliance in the Indo-Pacific, in particular, one which seduces India to help contain the power of China. Now, in concluding part, I want to tell, while China may think of its position in the Indo-Pacific as strong, it appears to be trapped in its own game. Its hasty regional expansion in the Indo-Pacific is unsustainable over time. There is a great risk of overstretching as China must cope with domestic challenges such as debt, aging population, environmental problems, and the coronavirus, as well as pushback from the other countries. Rory Midkoff suggests, quote, if cooperation with China is unrealistic, we need to move towards competitive coexistence, unquote. He further writes that the tools for constructing an Indo-Pacific to balance China will be development, deterrence, and diplomacy. The qualities underpinning those instruments will be solidarity and resilience. The dynamics in the Indo-Pacific will now probably be predicted on pushback against China, which we are already witnessing with the realignment of alliance, the rise of uh, regional powers and uh, American endurance, the simultaneous staring at each other will continue. Thank you. Thank you for uh ending right on time without me asking you to finish on time. Uh, I will now uh, start my presentation and I would request Dr. Stuti Banerjee to uh, kindly chair my presentation uh, in remembrance of all, all times in JNU. So do give me a 
morning shot by you know after yeah, so. definitely it's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend and uh, uh, the chair of this session, Dr. Uma Purushottam. She is currently the assistant professor at the Department of International Relations and Politics at the Central University of Kerala. Uh, Uma, all yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stuti. Uh, I would first like to thank uh, Nice and particularly my old friend from JNU, Dr. Pramod Jaiswar, for pushing us to propose a panel. Uh, so without, given the time limit, I, without further ado, let me move to my presentation. Uh, now, President Xi has uh, very clearly his rescinded uh, Tang Xiaoping's uh, policy of keeping a low profile, and that's something which Dr. Abraham had also alluded to. Uh, so she wants to pursue an active foreign policy, and he wants to shape China's strategic environment so that it becomes favorable to the rejuvenation of the great uh, Chinese nation or the so-called China dream. And this is exactly what we are witnessing in Afghanistan where China did not remain a passive uh, bystander like some countries, and instead it sought to shape events by engaging with the Taliban relatively early. So it's much more willing to take uh, risks now. So from being a regional power itself a few decades ago, today China has become a global power with interests across the globe and a certain amount of capability, primarily economic of course, to protect those interests uh, everywhere. But even a global power like China really cannot ignore its periphery. And it's important for China really to have a peaceful periphery for its own development. And this is how the Central Asian Republics are important to China. And it's uh, really no wonder that uh, President Xi Jinping first, when he announced in 2013, his ambitious one belt, one road policy at that time, which later uh, became the Belt Road Initiative, he announced it in Kazakhstan, you know, because China seeks to expand its markets and to integrate Eurasia through the overland uh, trade routes. All of the uh, Central Asian republics are, of course, part of the Belt Road Initiative. Uh, they have most, they have more or less resolved most of the border disputes. Uh, but China, of course, has other political, strategic, and economic re reasons to remain engaged in the uh, region. Uh, at the heart of uh, China's security concerns in Central Asia really is the stability of the Xinjiang province. Uh, we have, in recent times, we've heard so much about what is happening in Xinjiang, the post re-education camps and et cetera. But uh, the Western border for China has always been a source of tension and conflict even during uh, Soviet times. And so Western Xinjiang has always been seen as a source of instability. And uh, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan have borders with China. And there are a number of Tajiks, Kyrgyz, and Kazakh minorities who are within uh, China. So these uh, cross-border ethnic linkages remain. Uh, there are also about 400,000 Uyghurs who have settled in Central Asia, of which uh, 300,000 alone uh, live in Kazakhstan. So China is obviously very worried about the uh, potential spread of radicalism to China uh, from Central Asia. Uh, so they have they have been collaborating with the Central Asian uh, republics in this joint force uh, fight against three forces of evil: terrorism, extremism, and uh, separatism. Uh, but the Central Asian uh, republics are attractive to China not only because of this particular security concern, but also because they are resource rich. While you know China, on the other hand, is the world's largest consumer of oil and gas. Uh, trade has been increasing. Uh, tremendously between China and Central Asia. It's now about $30 billion. And of course, thanks to the BRI, China will probably remain the biggest investor in the region. Uh, so the Central Asian uh, re republics are also uh, of great geoeconomic geo uh, importance to China as a transit uh, uh, region. And this is not something which really started with the BRI, actually. You know, Even before uh, the BRI, uh, the China had this go out policy in the uh, in the 1990s, where you know they were telling their companies to go out and invest, stabilize the periphery. Uh, so they started with this rail link in Kazakhstan, and then of course they had this um, you know go west campaign in in the 2000s, which was later of course overtaken by the BRI. Uh, China is the top uh, trading partner for all of the CARs. Uh, so on the one hand, the uh, CARs see this as a beneficial partnership because they get the money for development because they themselves do not generate enough domestic finances for development. So they need the investments from China to join global trade uh, also because the region itself is very, very poorly integrated. Uh, so China has investments uh, in Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, particularly in hydrocarbons, mining interests in Kyrgyzstan and uh, agricultural investments across the region. I have some statistics here, which I will not go into because of uh, the uh, time limit. Uh, 
So it's been building infrastructure, uh, dams, uh, gas pipelines, etc. And uh, to be fair to China, actually, uh, despite the professions of all of the other uh, other uh, major powers, ultimately it's only China which has had the motivation, money, and the risk tolerance to get you know to get this infrastructure built and to make them work in in Central Asia. And Central Asia is notoriously a very very difficult environment to work in. Uh, but this has led to uh, in debt uh, to debts to China. Uh, Kazakhstan, um, no, Kyrgyzstan has 30.5 percent of its GDP uh, in debt to China. Tajikistan 16.1, and Uzbekistan 7.5. Uh, the military inroads have not been very strong, uh, probably in deference to the uh, strong defense and security ties that the Central Asian republics have with uh, Russia. However, it has been increasing, uh, and uh, China has stationed troops in Tajikistan to guard the Wakhan uh, corridor, and they have held counterterrorism exercises with the Tajik troops. Uh, counterterrorism remains a top priority for uh, China, by and they have been, uh, you know, persuading the uh, CARs to track, uh, you know, extremists, and through the SEO as well, uh, through the regional anti-terrorism um, structure, they have also been they have been focusing on uh, counterterrorism. It's also been trying to increase military equipment, uh, sales of military equipment. It's been producing and exporting uh, military equipment, giving training to some of these countries and giving some assistance in military technology. It has also conducted a number of military exercises with the Central Asian uh, countries. Again, this is not something which is recent. It's something which has been going on for almost uh, 20 years. I want to quickly add a few words about uh, Afghanistan because some countries included in Central Asia, the United States, for instance, uh, part of the reason the uh, Chinese are engaging with the Taliban is because uh, they want to, again, like in Central Asia, they want to prevent anti-Chinese based uh, terrorism from Afghanistan and they want to ensure that the Uyghur extremists do not get support from the Taliban. Of course, it has the economic uh, interest as well. It has an eye on Afghanistan's minerals and its uh, rare earth metals. And of course, having uh, influence in Afghanistan gives it an edge over India in regional politics and adds to India's encirclement by Beijing. I want to end by looking at some factors which prevent Central Asia from being uh, China's sphere of influence. One is, of course, Russia, the uh, seven factors that I identified. One is Russia. Uh, despite uh, China's considerable uh, influence in Central Asia, uh, the Russians remain very wary of the Chinese overtaking it in what it considers to be its near abroad. Uh, second, the public are also very wary of China. You know, the, there seems to be this uh, gap between the elites and the uh, lay people. The elites tend to be pro-China because of the money, uh, while the general people seem to be, uh, public seem to be very skeptical of Chinese economic and cultural expansion. Uh, it's, it's something which is called um, warm politics, called public by Susan Thornton. Uh, there have been a number of protests against uh, Chinese incursions in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, probably because the, uh, you know, the public there are very nationalist and they value their uh, newly gained independence. There have been even protests against marriages between Kazakh women and Chinese men. Uh, the people are also unhappy uh, because, you know, these are predominantly Muslim countries. They are unhappy about uh, China's repression of the Muslim minority in Xinjiang. Uh, though some of these countries did send a letter supporting China's uh, Uyghur incarceration camps, but these are basically for bargaining chips. Uh, there is also fear of becoming over-dependent on China, and there is some lingering xenophobia from the Soviet times, because that was when China was seen as a huge threat. Uh, the influx of Chinese immigrants is also seen as a problem, uh, particularly uh, because the Chinese employ chi uh, uh, Chinese at higher levels, and the lower paid jobs are given to the locals. Uh, finally, there is also criticism that Chinese is pursuing a neocolonial economic policy. It is exporting cheap economic goods and importing uh, valuable materials from these uh, countries. I think an interesting aspect of China's engagement with Central Asia is that it, it is part of only the SCO and not of the other regional organizations there like the CSTO and the EEU, uh, probably because they are all Russian dominated. I think, and that is one difference that I see with other um, uh, regions. Uh, but like all powers, uh, small powers in eras of great power competition, these states have increased their bargaining power and mileage and they have uh, struck this balance between Moscow and Beijing. Uh, and in conclusion, I think like in other regions, economic statecraft remains the primary tool uh, used for influence by China. And while China provides uh, development benefits to its uh, neighbors through trade investments, 
uh, etc. But they are expected to accommodate China's core interests. Uh, so while China's influence has grown in Central Asia, it has not yet overtaken uh, Russia, and the CARs have been smart enough to play off one against the other. Uh, yeah, I think that is it. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Can I raise a question? Yeah, oh, yeah please. Uh, okay. So uh, actually one question I have to you is, Uma, is um, you, how do you see Russia and China coming together in addressing some of the common challenges that they you know, you spoke about terrorism and the growing extremism and all of that. Now, given the situation that is happening in Afghanistan, in the immediate neighborhood like Central Asia, Iran, India, the first question is, is this going to lead to rise in terrorism? So um, Russia is doing a lot of, did a lot of military exercises with Central Asian nations. As far as I know, they are uh, helping the Central Asian nations to secure their borders. So do you find that there would be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, agree, uh, how would China, Russia, and Central Asia, would they come together to address this challenge in this region? And the other was to uh, Mr. Uh, Brijesh, you spoke about the Indo-Pacific. Now, your first thing was, uh, like, how do you see China responding to the, uh, you know, aggressive push by the United States in securing the Indo-Pacific as a domain which would be, they talk about interoperability and freedom of navigation. How do you see China countering this entire narrative of Indo-Pacific? Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, Jin, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Dr. Omar, um, thank you for the uh, interesting presentation. I just have a, um, question about, again, uh, as uh, uh, it, it's sort of a, a continuation of uh, what the, uh, was, uh, Dr. Sudhi Banerjee's question. Uh, it's also because you have some expert, I mean, expert, you have worked on Russia as well. I mean, so I just was wondering about this uh, discussion about um, China, Russia moving in the direction of an alliance. I mean, uh, I mean, could you please, uh, um, Make a comment on how, what do you think that uh, how and and how that is being um, uh, the discourse both from the Chinese and also from a Russian perspective, uh, but also taking the cue from what you talked about the uh, Russian and the Chinese sort of a, a competition in Central Asian context. Are there any other questions? Uh, maybe we can take them all together. Or is there anything that any of the other panelists would like to add to what they said? Then maybe we can, uh, you know, I can try to answer and Rajesh could also try to answer Sudhi's uh, question. I don't see any questions in the chat box. So anything that any of the panelists would like to add or ask each other? Okay, while you're thinking of your questions. Let me try and answer uh, what uh, Dr. Stuti and Dr. Jojin were asking me. Uh, let me start first with, uh, you know, the common challenges that uh, Russia and China, you know, see in Central Asia, particularly in, uh, in Afghanistan. I think there has already been an alignment of policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis counter terrorism and tracking down, uh, you know, extremist elements. I think the one um, challenge that both of them see as being common in their peripheries really is the question of you know islamic uh, radicalism spreading across the border in 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 russia's case they worry that if you know if there is radicalism in central asia it could easily seep in through the borders to uh, to uh, russia you know because central asians can more or less uh, particularly tajiks can more or less move very very easily to uh, to uh, russia uh, so, and they already have had this problem in Chechnya. So they are worried about that. Uh, I, I think there is an alignment of policies between uh, China and uh, Russia in Afghanistan as well. I think we have seen how, uh, you know, they, they uh, 
kind of continued to, I mean, they, they, they engage with the Taliban, they continue to engage with the Taliban, and they want to shape the events in Afghanistan. And I think the one assurance that both uh, Russia and China want in Afghanistan is that it is not used as a base for any kind of extremist activities against them. Particularly, I think they are worried about the Islamic State. And yes, this morning, last night, we already saw that uh, bomb blast, which has happened, uh, sadly. Uh, and I think that is the main concern for both uh, Russia and China there. Uh, to come to Georgian's uh, question about the uh, Russia-China alliance, it is something which you know, everyone in India keeps jumping about. But I think it's not yet an alliance, and particularly so in Central Asia, because like I said, uh, the Russians continue to see uh, you know, Central Asia as being part of their sphere of influence. And, and the Central Asians also have uh, you know, this kind of nostalgia for the uh, Russians, even though they are now trying out new, moving away from the Russian language. Uh, particularly the older generation, they still kind of look up to the Russians rather than to the Chinese. And um, again, the Russians have other problems as well with the Chinese. I mean, Ch China is a power which is rising and they are a power which is on the decline. So obviously it's not, some, uh, not an easy transition that is happening. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. And the Russians, of course, have had problems with a uh, you know, certain amount of xenophobia about Chinese immigrants through the Far East, for instance. Um, they worry about becoming a resource adjunct to the Chinese, like you know, other countries also. So it's not yet an alliance. Yes, they have increased cooperation in counterterrorism, military, you know, large sales, large sales of military equipment, uh, but not yet an alliance, I would say. Um, Brijesh, if, could, if you could answer Dr. Stuti's question. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, America is responding to China, China. China is responding to USA policy in present time in a more peaceful and constructive manner. He is using economic tools uh, for uh, replying in Indo-Pacific region. He is... Uh, giving uh, uh, economic edge to countries uh, to in to do in favor of the countries and uh, uh, china is uh, china is uh, not uh, coming aggressively before usa because uh, in this uh, globalized world and nuclear era he cannot afford direct war to usa so he is using uh, globalization and economic tools before usa thank you Okay, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, or does anyone want to add anything to uh, what was said? Okay, then uh, I think we are well ahead of time. So I'll just try and conclude uh, this session. Um, I think we've had a very rich, very diverse uh, set of uh, presentations. And uh, each one of the scholars, I think, uh, you know, went deep into uh, what is happening within the limited time that we had. Uh, but in conclusion, what I do see really is that uh, it would seem that in most regions, uh, China is using uh, economic statecraft to, inc uh, to increase its uh, influence across regions and then building on that build political influence as well. Uh, so what it is doing is really starting small, it's not going, making this uh, huge political influence or economic influence immediately. What it's doing is it's starting small, it's building, it's using these as building bricks uh, in the regions to become a regional power, which cannot be, you know, wherever it is, Latin America, North America, Australia, it's become a power which is inevitable, you know, so no one can afford to ignore China anymore in any of those regions. And then uh, as it becomes a uh, uh, an inevitable and unignorable uh, power in, in these regions, it, it is becoming this great uh, global power. And it is showing at least um, in terms of buying of the elites, at least in many of these regions, it is showing uh, that it has learned the lessons of uh, previous empires, Pax Americana, uh, Pax, uh, particularly well, I think. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank all the panelists, the audience and niece for joining us. Uh, and uh, if there is anything anyone else would like to add, uh, please feel free. We have some more time. Otherwise, I think we can conclude this session. Uh, there seems to be a question in the chat box. Oh, is there?
Who is it for? I can't see. Uh, the question is for Mr. Brijesh. It asks, what is China's vision in Indo-Pacific by revisionist approach? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, China's expanded vision is uh, driven internally by economic development and externally by geopolitical politics in Indo-Pacific region. And it shows the revisionist approach of China in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Okay. That was a quick answer. Uh, in that case, we could conclude this session and I'll now hand over, over to the uh, niece organizers. Distinguished Chair, Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the Chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you.